What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Uh, today, I'm not doing the sound effects preliminarily because I want to get in and get out of here uh, as quickly as possible, but it's not going to be easy for me to do this quickly, especially if I got a whole bunch of uh, theatrics going on. So, uh, but I want to. Uh, as I always do, give a shout out to the members of the Green Gorilla channel before I get started. I want to give a shout out to Isa Abdul Sahir, Anthony Taylor, Deshaun Nolly, Ab Media 83, Aaron Lloyd, Leroy Honeycutt, MLR, Julius Ferguson, Charles Rogers, Black Dog, Brother Love, Ryan Jackson, Infamous Chillin', Randall, Universal 178, 
Black's Word 404, Rashid Barnes, Aaron Smith, The Walt Diddy Show, D.H., See Truth, The Revelator, Gold Professor, The Nameless Protagonist, Black Pill, Ned Stark, Arthur Unknown, Odd Collard, Roderick Jackson, Dr. Tiasan Johnson, Damon Harris, Brian Williams, Kalan Jakala, Sherrod Martin, Ricky Dawson, NEU, Cedric Bowman, True 7360, BK Born Shahi, James Washington, Hostel Adept, Seven Coast Dojo, Ronan Martin, Shop Talk Live, WPR1, Roguish the Buildmonger, I Care, Force Windu, Lady Miss Thing Green, BGS Ivmore, and Marvin Battle Jr. Thank you for being members of the Green Gorilla Channel. And if you would like to become a member of the Green Gorilla channel, please, uh, you know, hit the join button next to the subscribe button on my channel page. Uh, and if you can tonight, please like the video. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, subscribe. And uh, again, share the videos. Hit the bell notification also. So uh, I want to give a shout out uh, thus far to Camp Low for reaffirming uh, his membership. and. Nasiana, uh, for the contribution. Thank you so much. So what what I want to do is to have a conversation, but it's going to be more of a cerebral conversation. Well, Diddy, I see you out there, brother. Uh, Malika Mabane, I see you out there. Issa Abdus, I hear, I see you. Damon Harris, I see you. Okay. So let me just say this. This is going to be more of a cerebral conversation about democracy. I started to have this conversation the last time I did a video on black men and their involvement in politics and how it's not patriarchy or how it's not misogyny. Black men having an independent politics and trying to create a situation in which they can have their interest heard, especially the way that they have been doing it. But I mean, there have been some people who haven't really actually been hitting the mark as far as I'm concerned. But in, re in regards to Ice Cube, I think he hit the mark principally on principal grounds because he went in with a program that was designed to improve the lot of black people globally in the community. And I think that that was an admirable thing to put on the table a plan or an agenda to help out all of black America, especially the most downtrodden and those persons who don't have access to political capital or who don't have access to capital in general. OK, so that's what he went in with a plan. Now, some argue that it might have not been the right time for him to come in with the plan because there were people who were upset because they want people to vote for Democrats. And the extent to which you veer away from the Democratic Party, you're somehow typecast as being a traitor to your race. That somehow you've done something unimaginable. You've done something unjust. You've done something unfair. You've done something traitorous. But... I want to put all of this in, pro in proper perspective and I have to take you through phases and steps. So this video won't even be the last time that I'm speaking about this issue because I have to go through series and series and series of steps for you to understand my argument about why the black, the pervasive way that black people do politics is just absolutely and utterly naive. And with all of the, Black people who've come through the political system in the 60s, I'm talking about civil rights leaders and, and leaders of the black power movement, they already gave us this information. So for us to be still caught up in the same rut is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I have to take you through steps and steps and steps and steps, which I don't want to, but I feel like I'm obligated to for you to understand what it is that I'm trying to articulate. All right? Thank you, Camp Lowe, for the donation. Thank you, Sage's Apprentice, for the donation. All right? And I should have came here yesterday to do this, but I was tired, man. I was tired. 
I'm not defeated or I don't feel like I'm spiritually deflated in any kind of way related to politics. But I will say this in case you don't know. And in case you're disillusioned or in case you're uninformed or. In case you might be sidetracked, the gender war is on and popping, man. It ain't went nowhere. It ain't going nowhere. It is right here. <laughs> taking place right in front of your eyes. It has gone nowhere. All it did was just change venue. All it did was just shape shift and take on a different form. And look, I'm, I don't even want to engage in a gender war for real, to be perfectly honest. But I think that the means by which for black men to begin to have an impact on their political reality is through looking at democracy in a different kind of way. And at the current moment, we just don't have the political wherewithal and the political acumen to do it. Now, let me retrace my steps. Let me just trace my retrace my steps so that you can understand where I'm going and what I'm talking about. I want to give a shout out to uh, my bro, Art Newstall TV out there. What's good with you, bro? Okay. And look, this is this. You might have to rewind this and look over this again because I'm about to give you political game. It's theory. I'm about to give you political theory. And it's not going to be easy to follow, but it's not going to be impossible to follow. So anyway, man, let me just get on with it. So in that video, I basically said, look, there is a market based theory of democracy. And I gave you the historical origins of it. And I told you that the market based approach to democracy is linked to anti populism, which means basically that when you let the populace take control over government, it's dangerous because the more direct the democracy is, the more the opportunity, uh, opportunity there is for tyranny, manipulation, and capriciousness. And I said, for this very reason, several founders of, um, uh, founders of American democracy or this so-called republic, whatever you want to call it, the United States of America, they were leery of di uh, direct democracy. They didn't like it. And I came up and said, not only were they against direct democracy, but people called social realist and social choice theorists were against direct, de uh, direct democracy or populism. I said that there's a social realist by the name of Joseph Schumpeter, and he said, look, citizens are incompetent. They're just stupid. They're not smart enough to deal with what's going on with the state. They just don't have enough know-how. They're they, they don't know. They're dumb. They're too dumb. Okay? And then there are people called social choice theorists who come up and they say, well, look, citizens might even be competent. They may be competent. But I'm not going to reject the competence of citizens. What I'm going to reject is active political participation directed towards the public or the common good. The common good. So basically what these social choice theorists do is they say that the ideal citizen is like a consumer, a customer. They go out and they shop for what they like. They go out and they look for politicians and they shop for the politicians that they like who represent, they think their interests and they vote for them. And then they leave political matters to the political experts and they don't get involved anymore because they're not. I mean, the value of their participation doesn't actually have anything to do with being actively involved in politics. Just go vote during the, the voting term, and then after that, return to your regular, uh, your regularly scheduled program. <laughs> I mean, that's just how it is, okay? Now, what I've tried to get you to understand is that black Americans unfortunately perceive voting or the economic model of democracy as the model. Uh, I mean, otherwise, why would you see so much energy and why would you see so much venom and vitriol being placed 
in electoral politics. Why? Why is there so much anger and animosity and, you know, finger pointing and blaming and why is all this even involved in the context of democracy? So-called democracy. Well, my view, first of all, like I said before, this is a wrong way of thinking about democracy. OK, it just it's not the right way to think about it. OK, then I tried to say, well, black people have a historical record of. And I'm talking about the civil rights movement, the black power movement, and even before the kind of organizing in the grassroots, uh, you know, organizations that were created. That was democracy. For us. And all of a sudden, we got the right to vote. We became members of, dem you know, these popular white political parties. And then if we forgot about all the organizing, we forgot all about political participation and worried about what's going on with the black masses. It now it just becomes political theory related to the economic model. And then we expect to actually get something done within this system. You'll never get anything done in this system. The system is not designed for you to be able to come into it and to have a paradigmatic or a substantive impact on it. It's not designed that way. It is always, the, first of all, let me just say this. It was never designed for black people to be part of the political system to begin with at all. Black men were considered to be three-fifths of men. You never were supposed to have a right to vote. And I, I, I keep saying this. I've been saying this a long time ago. I've been saying this a long time ago. And, and look, here's the deal. If you look at politics, the way these people look at politics, you'll always be behind because the first thing that they do is they make sure that any way that you have to impact the political system is going to be as least substantive as possible. It's not, you're not going to be able to do it. Not within the confines of the system itself. You have to work outside of the context of the system. But I got to walk you through the hoops to understand this. I got to get you to understand this. So anyway, man, I offered an alternative to the market-based conceptualization of democracy. I told you what the alternative was. I said that there's something called deliberative democratic theory. I got to talk to you about deliberative democratic theory because y'all don't know anything about it. You don't know like the various people who are proponents of it. All you know is go vote. Let's vote. Vote for this person. Vote for that person. Vote for that person. Vote for this person. Vote for the Democrat, the donkey, the independent, the green. That's not sophisticated enough. This is not going to get us anywhere. It's not getting us anywhere. And I'm trying to explain this to you, but people just don't get it. And I see people in the chat right now, like, you know, you got one woman who says the gender war is not over. Well, it is over. It's time to repopulate. The gender war is still on and popping. Because, first of all, let me explain something to this woman, man, just in case she doesn't know. The gender war started with white women. They're the ones that started the war. They started this. There was no gender war before they started the gender war. Like Bill Burr said, all of a sudden, as soon as it was time, it was time for black people to achieve rights and to build strong families. Guess what they came in and they did? What did they do? The first thing they came in and that they did was to start talking about how they were too oppressed. They too are a minority. They too are subjected to injustices, domination, oppression, and the like. 
Now, these are the same people who were involved in colonialism, slavery, Jim Crow, lynching, segregation, the whole nine. They were involved in that project. But instead of being responsible for it, what they did was they saw it as an opportunity to garner rights for themselves, to get more of the piece of the pie for themselves. And they're still not done eating. These women are not done eating. They ain't done with the program yet. They're going to continue to get some more. They're not done with their work right now. That's why black people are last on the damn docket. You ever been to court and you got you, you see a whole bunch of people in the courtroom ready to get their case heard and to get the shit out of the way. But your ass is the last person that's going to be heard on the docket. By that time, the judge, who knows what attitude that motherfucker's going to have. Who knows? But the reality is, these women, man, white women, have decided that they are a minority. But the funny thing about it is, if you look at their voting record, they don't even vote. With the fucking ideology. They vote for whiteness, man. They use any excuse to prevent us from being able to be united and to work towards programs that can help us collectively. And they, they behave collectively. They can talk all the shit they want to. At the end of the day, they are playing good cop, bad cop. And black people are too stupefied by the process, apparently, to understand how to fucking circumvent it. I just don't understand this shit. We've been dealing with this shit for the past, what, how many years? Ever since we got voting rights and were able to be openly involved in the political process? We got we to gotta get away from this bullshit, man. And I see you, BGS. Hold me down, man, in the chat, man, because I ain't got no time for no foolishness tonight, man. I'm trying to get through something and let people know something, but it's difficult to let them know it. Because I have to get theoretical in order for them to understand it. But we keep playing the same political game. We keep playing the same political game. This isn't about the individual actions of black people as much as it is about how to actually engage the political process. And what is effective and what is ineffective. Because I can tell you right now, these women are gloating, thinking that they're doing something because they're visible. Visibility does nothing in relation to furthering political advancements for a demographic of people in a country that uses optics but continues on with the prevailing method of, of acting in the world. America is an imperial superpower, man. It's a capitalist, imperialist superpower. And you got to have big money to play the game. It doesn't matter if the donkey's in the office or if the, if the elephant's in the office. But we like to get emotional about politics and talk about, well, Trump's a racist. Or another person's a racist. Or this is the lesser of two evils. And look, the system is designed to be what it is. And we got to call a spade a spade. America is a capitalist, imperialist, corporatist country. Bottom line. And I don't understand why people don't understand this. America is going to give subsidies and welfare to corporations before they'll give it to the average citizen. They'll give you something if they need to, to circumvent a catastrophe, but most of the subsidies are going to go to the corporations. How much money went to the corporations during COVID versus the average citizen in the United States? I guarantee you more money went to those corporations. They called them small businesses. Ruby Steakhouse, small business. NFL, small business. It doesn't matter who you put in there. You had Obama, man, Barack Obama. And, you know, it was good to see a black man in the office. But what, uh, what improvement did black people's lives 
What what improvement occurred to black people's lives during the course of his presidency? Obamacare? What improvement occurred? I'm just asking the question because I don't see the improvement, man. The last I checked, you still go to the hood, it's family dollars, it's weave shops, there's still food deserts, and black people still doing the same thing they were doing in there before he got into office. He said change you can believe in. He recognized he basically represented not paradigmatic change, but that little incremental change, that little, you know, that superficial change, that change of a face. I mean, that man dropped more drones in Africa than George Bush did. And he's a fucking African. And I know y'all don't like, you know, I guess y'all ADOS FBA'd out over here or whatever the case may be, but you got to think about it. You got a guy from Africa, father from Africa, and he dropping bombs in Africa like shit. What would it do? What the business is? He locking up Im illegal immigrants, putting them in cages, just like Trump is. You think that you're going to get a black woman in the office and then all of a sudden she's going to pull away from the primary imperatives of American society, which is basically imperialistic and corporatist. Come on, man. It's not going to happen. It ain't going to happen. And so to imagine that because you got a face that looks like yours or a body part that's yours or a sexual orientation that's like yours and that they're going to move away from the project of American practice. The way America has acted in the world is ridiculous. It's not going to happen. I just don't understand what people don't get about this. Like we're making steps to change American society. No, we're not. All we're doing, and I and I said this again, and I'm a, I, I say it again and again and again is what I meant to say. All we're doing is changing the people in the slots. We're not changing the practice of the nation. That's not changing anything. But I told you I wanted to get professorial tonight, man. I, I, I do. Because I don't think you understand what democracy actually is. And I told you. I said, look, there's a difference between the norms that apply to the market and the norms that are supposed to apply to the public when you're making decisions for the public. It's a different set of norms that you're supposed to abide by. So the question then becomes, well, if it's the case that the norms of the market don't really fit in well with the norms that are supposed to apply in politics. Well, then, what are the norms that apply in politics or in the public forum? What, what kind of norms actually apply there? And I said, well, you can begin to explore the answers to that question by examining deliberative democratic theory. That's what I said. And I said, the main feature of deliberative democratic theory is the exploration of how deliberation, communication, conversation enhances public reason and contributes to legitimate lawmaking. Now, private reason is different than public reasoning. Let me, let me say this again so you understand it. Private reasoning is different than public reasoning. When you reason privately, you, you, you're engaging in market-based activity or thinking. Oh, what do I want today? A Coca-Cola or Pepsi? I want Domino's or Pizza Hut. Nobody cares. Because what that decision... What that decision does in relation to impacting other people's lives is infinitesimal. 
It has no direct relation to my life whether or not you like Domino's or Pizza Hut or Papa John's or Coca-Cola or Pepsi. It's a private matter, a private choice. But if you decide to get in your car and drive drunk and vote on laws that say it's okay to drive drunk or they say that people can't drive drunk, if the laws that you make have the ability to impact the public, you're using public reasoning. So the argument that I'm trying to make is, is that deliberative democratic theorists argue that using what's just for your own good in a public setting is not in the interest of the public at all. It's the wrong kind of norm to use in that setting. Now, I also went into a spiel about how, you know, different deliberative democratic theories, they differ in the way they perceive problems unique to conversation and deliberation and how to manage these problems. Because I can tell you right now, we, even in the manosphere, people get into disagreements when they have conversations all the time. So what kind of norms should guide political decision making? This is what we don't talk about. We don't have conversations about this. All we do is assume that you just go in and vote and that's it. That's not a that's not an intelligent way to approach the subject. That's never been how black people have engaged the political system in the United States. And the fact that this is what we're doing now, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. I really can't comprehend it. And then to have people like Kwame Tory and Charles Hamilton write books about it, for people to come up and step up and make statements about it. I mean, we still have archives where you have the best and the brightest black minds from that era engaged in roundtable discussions about what works, what doesn't work, and where we need to go from here. And then we're still doing the same stupid shit without consulting what they've said before. I don't get it. I just don't understand us and the way we approach approach politics. I don't get it. I'm confused about it. Is all I'm saying. So anyway, man, let me get into this. So I say, look, there's three different deliberative democratic theories that I, I like to use as landmarks. So you can understand this whole paradigm and why what black people are doing is absolutely ineffective politically. It's just ineffective. But we act like we're doing the greatest thing since, you know, the fucking civil rights movement. Like we're actually pushing the needle in the direction of progress. We are not. At all. And I have to explain why, but I got it's going to take me three videos to do this. So let me get started with the work, man. Anyway, so there is a deliberative democratic theorist named Amy Gutman, and she usually is attended by another thinker named Dennis Thompson. And they basically say, you know why people can't get it together politically? Because there's moral disagreements when people have conversations and they can never get over the moral disagreement. So therefore, we can't actually have a democratic process with integrity involved in it because we keep reaching impasses about these moral disagreements. So what they say is, okay, since we know that moral disagreements causes problems in deliberation, what we need to do is set up or establish a set of principles, a regulative principles that we can use as a guideline to get the conversation going again when it gets stale and all fucking you know, uh, uh, static and, and, and it gets blocked. So that's one set of thinkers with one approach. Moral disagreement is the main problem. We can solve it with a set of principles. Then you got another set of deliberative democratic theorists. One of them is named Iris Young. And she says, well, you got people who are excluded from the democratic process. They're marginalized. They're left out. So that's the crisis with democracy. People who are marginalized and left out of the process. 
So what we need to do is we need to include people who are left out of it. And if we leave, if we, we get them to be included in the process, then we'll have more legitimate lawmaking and we'll have more legitimate policies and, 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 and acts that come out of the democratic process. So that's the second one. But then there's another guy whom I happen to believe is accurate. His name is John Dreisett. And he says, look, you got instrumental rationality everywhere in politics, which is another form of private reasoning. And that's what is basically restricting the democratic process. So what you have to do is you have to find areas or pockets where you can replace instrumental reasoning or economic reasoning or private interest reasoning and supplant it with public reasoning. That's what you need to do. Now, there's a whole bunch of different deliberative democratic theories, a whole bunch of them, a whole lot of them. Too many to name. But the point is, one of the things that they do, uh, beyond anything else that they do, okay, they basically say that public reasoning is better than individual private reasoning. Bottom line. Now, people don't sometimes can't get their head around that. They think everything is about what's best for them. Me, 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 me. My, 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 my. What's best, what's good for me. But damn, if you, if you got a family, like if, let's say, for example, you are a patriarch. Or you can be a matriarch, whatever. You can't just look out for what's good for you. You can be a member of a team. Like you play for the Lakers. You can get the, you know, your triple double every game. But if your team is not winning the, or getting to the playoffs, what's the good of you getting your triple doubles every game? That's individual interest, but it doesn't add up to what's best for the good of your family or your team. So anyway, man. Again, what I'm going to do is go to this classical model. Then after that, I'm going to have to talk about the inclusion model. Then after that, I'm going to talk about John Dryzak and what I think is the best model. Today, all I can talk about is Amy Gutman and Dennis Thompson. I can only talk about one perspective right now. That's it. I don't have time to talk about them. I'm going to have to do this in a series of three videos. But some of y'all ain't going to even have the patience to keep up with it. You ain't gonna have the, you're not going to have the patience to, 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 to stay there with me. Some of you will, but some of you won't. I'm not here tonight to entertain and to go off on people. But I just don't want us to be politically naive forever. I don't want us to be politically naive forever. I want us to understand where we are politically and to understand what we actually can do to make an impact on this system. And how to prevent from being co-opted, led astray, hoodwinked, and go for the banana in the tailpipe. Again and again and again and again and again. So let me get into it. So, so here it is. No, no, no interruptions anymore. No anger, no nothing, just the straight facts, okay? So anyway... You got these philosophers, the name Amy Gutman, Dennis Thompson. They say, look, we can seek to find a remedy to the deficit in deliberative activity in our politics and in our theory. What we can do is offer up three principles, three procedural principles that if you follow them will help to eliminate that deficit. So the three principles are reciprocity, reciprocity. Publicity and accountability. Now, I don't have a visual to put up, but just understand reciprocity, publicity and accountability. These three principles are established to guide the political process. But also in coordination with those three procedural principles. There are three other principles that are supposed to establish the content of public policy. Basic liberty, basic opportunity, 
and fair opportunity. Okay? Now, I'm going to spend most of my time outlining the first three. A little bit of time outlining the last three. Okay? Let's talk about reciprocity to begin with. The first thing they say is that the foundation of reciprocity is the capacity to seek fair terms of social cooperation. For their own sake, just be fair. Let's seek fair terms of social cooperation for their own sake. And that's the abstract. But ultimately, it's calling on citizens to search for fair terms of social cooperation in the presence of moral disagreement. Fair terms of social cooperation in the presence of moral disagreement. We don't know how to do that, apparently, because what we do, if we don't get what we want. We say shit like I'll never forgive you or fuck you. <laughs> or we use epithets. You know, we, we go off on each other when we don't get what we want. But that's our current practice. That's not what we should be doing, but that's what we are doing. So ultimately what they say is when you make a moral claim in the public sphere, you have to use terms that everyone else can accept. And reciprocally, when others make moral claims, they got to make them in ways that the other person can accept. So in other words, name calling, trying to make people feel guilty, that's off the table, man. That's off the table, but we do it. So we have to offer, they say, political reasons to others that are shared or could come to be shared by others. That's abstract still. I'm going to flesh it out. So it's important to note, though, that this principle is comprised of two fundamental components. There's a moral component and the other is an empirical uh, component. The moral component is just basically what I just said before. It's intrinsically valuable to search for fair terms of social cooperation. The empirical component is plausibility, man. Like when you invoke a claim, a moral claim that depends upon a matter of fact, then you have to be able to at least be able to refer to data to prove the fact that you're trying to put forward out there for the public. So you got two components. But ultimately, you're supposed to search for fair terms of social cooperation for its own sake. You're not supposed to try to win by using power and advantage and all of that. You're supposed to listen. You're not supposed to try to win. You're supposed to listen to find out what's best for the whole organism. Anyway, what they try to do is they try to put reciprocity in between what's what they call prudence and impartiality. That's where they try to fix it. And I'm telling you, this is abstract, so you got to listen to me. You might have to go over this more than once. Reciprocity requires citizens to appeal to reasons that are recognizably moral in form and mutually acceptable in content. If you try to convince something or convince somebody of something, you can't just say it's going to be this way because I said it's going to be this way. If you make a political argument, you can't force somebody to accept your point of view. You have to try to convince them to accept your point of view. And you have to use reasons that other people can accept. You can't just go in and say, well, I believe it, motherfucker. You're going to believe it, too punk bitch, and that's the end of the discussion. That's not how public discourse works. I'm just saying, like you, like, imagine it, well, why do you, why do you believe that this is the case? Why do you believe abortion should be legal, should, you know, be legal and should stay the same way that it is? Because I said so, motherfucker. That's not a public reason. <laughs> it's just not a public reason. 
And if you tell somebody, well, I believe in pro-life. Well, why? Because Jesus said so. Because cause that's my, my God, my Jesus. Well, it's a whole bunch of people in America that don't believe in Christianity. So that's not a public reason for them. So we have to be able to make arguments and give reasons and, and, and provide rationale that everybody can understand and use language that you know is not going to be offensive to people. We can continue to go off on people and name call over and over and over again in the political domain. And I do it. I'm guilty of it myself. But in the end, if we want a constructive politics, we got to understand what reciprocity is. If you don't want somebody to give you some chicken shit reason, then don't offer a chicken shit reason. Have a good reason predicated on reasons that they can understand and take them through the logical steps just like you went through the logical steps to come to the conclusion that you reached. That's what reciprocity is. So they say that this principle, it sits between prudence and impartiality. Now, if you're prudent, you got to appeal to your self-interest. What's the use of putting forth an argument to defend anything if it's not in your self-interest? But at the same time, you can't go overboard with prudence. You can't go overboard with self-interest. They say, and this is what they say, prudence merely calls for citizens to appeal to their own self-interest and to bargain in order to minimize the negative effects of moral disagreement. Now, prudence or bargaining may seem attractive as a deliberative democratic principle because we're familiar with it. It's the paramount principle of our capitalistic or economic system. But they say there's two reasons why you should, you should reject it on relying on prudence as a deliberative democratic principle. First, they say the problem with relying on bargaining as a substitute for moral reasoning is that it rests on too thin a conception of what citizens owe one another in an increasingly interdependent society. That's a lot to take in. When bargaining is the primary deliberative democratic principle, citizens take an antagonistic stance towards one another and no longer perceive mutual well-being as a legitimate social and political goal. If all you're doing is bargaining for what you can get, as much as you can get, you are antagonistic. You are divisive as a matter of principle. That's why they reject prudence, because it, it basically makes people start looking out for their self-interest and bargaining for what they can get without even caring about what's in the best interest of the collective. So that's the first reason. And they say, secondly, because there's so much inequality, it's a mistake to make bargaining a democratic principle. Because those who have more power in the bargaining positions are going to use that power to create an even greater advantage for themselves, which would in turn create even greater inequality and more democratic imbalance. So if you say you really are dedicated to democracy, which is the rule of the many, the rule of the mob, the rule of the populace, if you really are dedicated to that, then you can't just say, well, I'm bargaining for what I can get. Especially if you live in a society where there's so much inequality as such that exists in America. It can't work. <clears throat> so anyway, so they say reciprocity is better equipped to regulate more disagreement than is prudence. But then how does this measure up to impartiality as a principle for governing more disagreement where well, they say well reci reciprocity requires more reasoning that is mutually acceptable while it does reciprocity does it requires more reasoning that is mutually acceptable impartiality requires more reasoning that is universally justifiable 
Let me repeat that again. Reciprocity requires more reasoning that is mutually acceptable, but impartiality requires more reasoning that is universally justifiable. What reciprocity does is it seeks to achieve its goals through deliberation, through talking, communicating. But impartiality seeks its goal through demonstration. And this is a quote for them. The principle of impartiality affirms that political reasoning should be moral, but denies that it must be mutually acceptable in the way reciprocity prescribes. Okay, so you're demonstrating some shit. That doesn't mean that the other person is using it, your demonstration, as a means to find what it is that you're saying acceptable and it's a go-to. Okay, let's follow that plan. You're just dictating what you consider to be morally acceptable. You got to convince people in the public sphere or in politics. You have to convince them. You got to talk to people. You got to communicate with them for real and let them feel you. Now, for example, if a moral claim purportedly has been demonstrated to be correct or it's assumed to be based on impersonal reasoning, there's no need to consult with others to verify its legitimacy. The claim is true on its own merits. And if there's any disagreement concerning the validity of an impartial moral claim, the implication is that someone else has erred in reasoning. So the implications of this impartial stance itself are evidence of its weakness as a principle for regulating moral disagreement. The impartial stance basically establishes rigid, comprehensive moral outlooks. If there's moral disagreement, it is assumed that there's a breakdown in reasoning, moral reasoning, but the possibility of reasonable pluralism or a difference of opinion is never assumed. So if you know the truth and the other motherfucker is just too stupid to be able to come to the conclusion that you've reached based upon your own impartial, and I'm using finger quotes right here, your impartial reasoning, then you're dissing the other person. Maybe you, maybe you are wrong. And you think you're right. You think you're impartial, but maybe you're not, is, is what they're saying. If there's going to be moral disagreement, you can't just assume that you've reached the true conclusion impartially. You need different kind of principles, they say. And they say, look, those citizens whose comprehensive moral views are accepted as the norm find themselves in the majority. From an impartial perspective, the majority holds the correct view. Even in cases where conflicting reasonable beliefs and conflicting moral considerations flourish. This is where I feel black men in the manosphere find themselves. The prevailing wisdom is that men are patriarchal. That men are oppressive, dominating, and that they're rapist and abusive. This is the prevailing norm in our culture. And there are people who are using arguments to demonstrate to black men that they are erroneous in their moral reasoning. There's a moral flaw that they have. As opposed to there being conflicting reasonable beliefs that black men in the manosphere have. So the result is that the moral view held by the minority is tolerated as opposed to actually their interests absorbed and taken up into the conversation or to the deliberation when it, as it pertains to decision making. So if this is the case, if impartiality is the norm, then you can't expect to resolve moral conflicts in future circumstances and avoid moral confrontation. If you're a minority and your viewpoint is just merely tolerated. And it's not perceived as reasonable. It's just something that we tolerate. You're not going to be able to resolve the conflict in future circumstances. And then two, 
Mere toleration creates permanent moral divisions among citizens. And it's going to make collective moral progress even more difficult, if not impossible to get to. So what they say is, as a regulative ideal, impartiality makes things worse rather than makes things better when you got moral disagreement. What you should aim for is reciprocity. So it's the midpoint between prudence, which is self-interest, and impartiality, which is demonstration. Reciprocity, they say, engenders mutual respect and encourages ongoing discussion and debate in the presence of deep-seated moral disagreement. Now, this is why I've been saying again and again and again, over and over and over again, at some point, we need to have a conversation with the people who disagree with us. But see, right now, they don't want to have a conversation because they're involved in what they consider to be. I'm just telling you what I think about it. I could be wrong. But right now, they're looking after their self-interest. They're not using reciprocity as a guide. Bottom line, and this has nothing to do with electoral politics at the current moment. Nothing at all. Because electoral politics in and of itself is just the market-based viewpoint of democracy. That's voting is the least thing you do to be a democratic participant. That's the minimum. Imagine that people have already done the heavy lifting to try to figure out What's going to be on the agenda to be voted on? But you haven't been a pri a privy to any of the deliberation that's taking place at all. You haven't heard any of the arguments back and forth. You haven't been privy to any of the conversation, you know, at all. You just vote. What the fuck you voting for? You don't even know what you voting on. You're just voting on your feelings. Or you're voting, especially as it pertains to electing people in politics. But I got to get through this, man. So anyway, reciprocity, they say, engenders mutual respect and encourages ongoing discussion and debate in the presence of deep-seated moral disagreement. In cases where moral agreement cannot be reached, because the best moral understanding the citizens can muster does not show them which position should be rejected from a deliberative perspective or when competing moral claims are inherently incompatible, reciprocity requires we adopt the principle of moral accommodation. This entails adopting an attitude of mutual respect towards those with whom we disagree on critical moral issues. It requires a favorable attitude towards and constructive interaction with the person with, her, uh, with whom one disagrees. Such an attitude is a virtue that would prevent citizens from sinking into vulgar moral subjective, subjectivism, which is, if you don't do what I want you to do, fuck you. Fuck Ice Cube. Or I'll never forgive you. So anyway, they say the virtue of mutual respect or accommodation is composed of a series of civic minded dispositions intended to foster, uh, foster the principle of reciprocity. And I wish I had these outlined. I'm going to make a short video to encapsulate all of this is what I need to do. So they say the virtue of mutual respect is composed of a series of civic-minded dispositions intended to foster the principle of reciprocity. The first is civic integrity, which is comprised of three virtues, consistency in speech, consistency between speech and action, and integrity of principle. Now, everybody knows what consistency in speech is and action. 
Well, consistency in speech, of course, is different than consistency in action, but here it is. Consistency in speech requires that citizens maintain moral positions separately from political circumstances in which they find themselves. It means that you are going to be sincere and not just adopt moral positions because they are politically or strategically advantageous. You can't just hop from view to view to view to view on whether or not it's politically expedient. That's not consistency in speech. Consistency between speech and action calls for citizens to behave in ways that support their moral positions. For example, it's hypocritical to argue for the deportation of all illegal immigrants but you got the motherfuckers working in your crib. <laughs> and then integrity of principle, which is the third civic minded disposition, right? Or principle. Integrity of principle requires citizens to accept the logical conclusions and the implications of their moral positions. For example, if you argue in favor of the death penalty, you have to be prepared to deal with the possibility that innocent motherfuckers might get executed. And if you can't accept the fact that innocent people will be executed, then you got to forego the position of capital punishment. If you don't mind innocent people being put to death, okay, then you can hold on to the death penalty. But if you feel like it's a problem for innocent people to be killed by the state, then you might have to rethink your position on the death penalty. So then they say there's a second principle of accommodation, which they call civic magnanimity, which also has three component parts like the ones I just talked about. They said you have acknowledgement and speech, you have to have open-mindedness and economy of moral disagreement. Acknowledgement in speech requires us to recognize that those with whom we disagree morally hold positions that are legitimately reasonable and that we should respect those positions even if we disagree with their positions. Open-mindedness compels us to adopt an undogmatic stance towards those with whom we disagree morally. It requires us as political actors to be open to the possibility of being persuaded by somebody else's arguments. And the economy of moral disagreement calls on citizens to seek, to ration, uh, seek the rationale that minimizes rejection of the position they oppose. I mean, basically, this virtue consists in offering reasons to those we disagree with morally in ways that are the least offensive to them and perhaps even amenable to their own moral sensitivities. You just can't call, come out calling motherfuckers patriarchal. You're a patriarch because the viewpoint is in disagreement with your own. You got to offer reasons that are different than just calling people names and shit. And accusing them of certain kind of behaviors. So in the end, Gutman and Thompson argues that the principle of reciprocity is the most attractive alternative to prudence and impartiality because it's a principle that's better equipped to deal with the problem of moral pluralism. Now, I don't know if you know what moral pluralism is, but you live in a society where there is moral pluralism. People have different ideas about what is right and what is wrong. And this is an ineradicable feature of, contem of contemporary Western societies. It just is. This ain't like motherfucking Rome where everybody's got the same viewpoint or Viking culture where it's one rule. There's a whole bunch of different people out here with different viewpoints about what's right and what's wrong. So the idea of reciprocity is not to aim to persuade citizens to alter their moral beliefs. It's not. But it's a regulative ideal that intends to encourage citizens to discover what is it about other people's beliefs that can be accepted 
and policies that can be accepted by citizens with whom they fundamentally disagree. How can you hold it all together in the face of disagreement? Now, that's the first part of this shit, man. And I ain't going to keep going so deep and far off into it. But I want to thank the people who've donated. You rock and roll. Keep going. Keep learning. Thank you, uh, Ricky Manor. I want to give a shout out to some other people that made donations a little bit earlier. Focus 56. Thank you, sir. Uh, ICP 13. Thank you, sir. Uh, Underrated Darkness. Thank you, sir. Ebo Sosa. Thank you, sir. War Child Games. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Said he said. Thank you so much, sir. So that's all they have to say about reciprocity, okay? But they have two more principles that are still left. And I'm going I'm to give it I'm gonna give it 30 more minutes and then I'm out of here, man. I, I'm going to have to break it into parts. Thank you, Cedric Bowman, man. I appreciate you. I'm just trying to give you the schematics of what people in philosophy are thinking about democracy. I want y'all to know this shit. It's my supreme desire to make sure you know everything I know. Because what good is it for me to know it? If my people don't know it. It makes no sense for me to know these things and not to be imparted to you. But anyway, man, I'm getting too passionate in my expression. So, so did they argue, this, these people, Amy Gutman and Dennis Thompson, they argue that the second fundamental regulative principle for a deliberative democracy is publicity. They claim that the reasons that officials and citizens give to justify political actions and the information necessary to assess those reasons should be public. So we're talking about publicity. We already went over reciprocity. Now we're talking about publicity. And they say, yeah, there are times when publicity conflicts with other important democratic values like liberty, opportunity, and deliberation. And they also recognize there are cases where publicity is detrimental or seems detrimental to pre uh, preserving important secrets that political officials deem necessary to maintain national security. But they insist that although the principle of publicity has limitations, those limitations ought to be publicly affirmed. We got to know what you, if you say that we can't have information about so on, et cetera, et cetera, well, you better tell us, uh, give us a legitimate public reason why. So anyway, there's a utilitarian argument that basically puts forth the idea that without the governing principle of publicity, public officials would be placed in situations where they would be tempted to violate the public trust. Hence, publicity as a regulative democratic principle serves as a means to help keep politicians' interest in line with public interest. But, a deontological argument basically puts forward the notion that if a policy cannot meet the test of publicity, then it's not just. For example, if a nuclear nation encourages another nuclear nation to destroy their weapons while secretly preserving theirs, then the policy is unjust as the public information of such a strategy would defeat its purpose. So from this deliberative perspective, Public policy should be acceptable to those who are affected by them. Now, according to Gutman and Thompson, neither of these arguments works from a deliberative democratic perspective. And that was probably too much for me to give you there, but don't worry about it. I'm going to get through this. Because there's a difference between utilitarian thinking and deontological thinking. Utilitarian thinking, if you remember, if you've been to college, it's the moral point of view that asserts that you should perform that action that preserves the greatest amount of pleasure or that promotes the greatest amount of pleasure for the most amount of people possible and it minimizes pain for the greatest amount of people possible. 
But deontology is a, a, a moral perspective or a viewpoint, ethical perspective that says that don't operate by a principle of action that you can't at the same time will be a universal moral law for all. If you can do it, everybody else can do it. And always does it. If you can't justify your action on the grounds that everyone can do it and always do it, then you can't do it either. So anyway, they say, well, look, the utilitarian position only promotes publicity in order to meet an instrumental demand, which is checking the self-interest of politicians. And the Kantian argument, which is deontology, is insufficient in that it only meets the demands of a thought experiment. That is, it only requires hypothetical as opposed to actual publicity. Neither position takes into account the role publicity plays in the enhancement and expansion of concrete or actual deliberative democratic values. Which I'm going to list now. First, public consent can only be acquired when citizens are aware of the policies that affect them. Let me repeat that. Public consent can only be acquired when citizens are actually aware of the policy that affect them. Without such knowledge, the legitimacy of public policies and those who draft them would be questionable. Publicity then creates a sense of consensual participation in political processes, especially when you have moral pluralism, which is people in societies with differing opinions. So that's the first thing. Second, publicity helps to broaden moral and political perspectives. When you are forced to share your moral and your political reason in the open, when people are forced to do that, they often have to account for interests other than their own, which is called meeting the condition of generality. You ain't the only person out here with an interest. And when you make your interest public, other people learn about what your position is and you have to account for other interests as well. The third, reasons must be public to fulfill the potential for mutual respect. They say an economy of moral disagreement is possible only to the extent that there is a robust exposure of various comprehensive views. Citizens cannot even potentially become amenable to one another in pluralistic societies if they don't share their arguments and moral perspectives openly and candidly with one another. So mutual respect is undergirded by the proliferation of public reasons. And this is why I think it is very important for black men in the manosphere to have a voice and to make their expressions public. Even if they get rejected, they still at least need to be heard. And lastly, they say publicity creates the potential for a self-correcting quality to be embraced among citizens in pluralistic societies. If citizens' political arguments and moral positions are not made public, then they cannot be evaluated by others, never creating the potential for review and revaluation. Or reevaluation. So, publicity, then, for the reasons mentioned above, is an attractive and a deliberative democratic principle. Okay? Now, I got one last one to get to, and then after this, I'm out. It's a Friday, but I'm so blessed. I'm here. But, so you got reciprocity, publicity, and now we're going to what they think is the third regulative principle that has to be adopted in a deliberative democratic society in order to deal with the problem of moral disagreement, accountability. So you got reciprocity, publicity, and accountability. Now, according to these thinkers, Gutman and Thompson, the third major principle that should govern the political process is accountability. They argued that the demand of universal accountability, which in deliberative settings requires each citizen to be accountable to all the others, is challenged by political representation. 
What I mean by political representation is that not everybody is involved in deliberative processes in the government in the context of the United States at the federal, state, or the local level. So how do you hold people accountable if they're representatives? We'll get to that. But it's challenged by representation, which is necessary because of the pure number of citizens present in the kind of society in which we live. But it poses two challenges to universal accountability, which means that every citizen has to be accountable to every other citizen. There are no motherfuckers that are above reproach and above accountability. So there's two challenges that are posed by representation. One concerns who gives reasons and the other concerns to whom the reasons should be given. Let me repeat that. Representation poses two challenges to universal accountability. One concerns who gives reasons, the other concerns to whom the reasons should be given. They characterize the first problem as the challenge of specialization, and they depict the second problem as the challenge of constituency. Let's talk about the former first, the challenge of specialization. So what is it? The challenge of specialization can be basically summarized by the following question. Like, do politicians that represent us have an obligation to rationalize or justify their choices to us? Do they have to take their time to explain what the fuck they're doing to us? <laughs> because they make choices all the time. Now, this is one of the things that's a problem for black people, I can tell you right now. Because we're not holding these motherfuckers accountable. But I digress. Politicians are full-time deliberators. They're specialists. They're, they are experts. And there might be what people in communicative theory or deliberative democ democratic theory call semantic noise. Semantic noise is people not actually being able to understand each other, not being able to communicate in such a way that they can mutually comprehend what each other are talking about, right? So there's semantic challenges and there are epistemic challenges that are going, and epistemic is knowledge challenges, which arise as politicians attempt to explain their moral positions to their constituents, which is what you are. You're a constituent for the people you vote for. So these semantic and epistemic challenges point out that the division of political labor creates barriers between citizens and politicians. And it promotes elitism. Where those who deliberate dominate those who do not. And I'm, I'm going to give you a list of some elitist arguments. The first anti-deliberation argument assumes that some groups have a diminished capacity to deliberate, which marginalizes their inclusion in deliberative settings. Some groups have a diminished capacity to deliberate, which marginalizes their inclusion in deliberative settings. But Amy Gutman and Demis Thompson respond to that charge by pointing out that disadvantaged groups often have representatives from within their ranks that possess the ability to speak the language of hegemonic groups or the elite power elite groups, which foregoes that concern. And plus they say, look, The disadvantage in deliberation is not really the main cause of oppressed group status. It's the lack of power that's the cause. So you got Martin Luther King Jr. to speak for people who can't really speak all that eloquently. You got Dr. Johnson and Dr. Curry to speak the fancy speak. So stop all the ideas are related to, well, people can't really deliberate with us. Well, you know, no. Another anti-deliberation argument assumes that members of advantaged groups 
present arguments that are not, or excuse me, that are taken more seriously than that of other groups in discursive settings. So like white people, members of advantaged groups present arguments that are taken more seriously than that of other groups in discursive settings. Some people even say that men, you know, or advantage and their arguments are taken more seriously. I don't see how for black men at all, but you know, it is what it is. Perhaps because they talk more in public settings, advantage groups' positions are better known and acceptable to the public. Gutman and Thompson respond to that challenge by pointing out that the practice of deliberation has the potential to overcome the influence of status in the political process, especially more so than that of bargaining. The initial views of the advantage can be challenged in openly discursive settings, and afterwards a more open-minded discussion of issues can potentially ensue. The third and final criticism of deliberation is that it favors certain group style of arguments or argumentation more than others. From this perspective, marginalized or disadvantaged groups tend to make arguments that are more passionate than rational. So they are clearly disadvantaged in deliberative settings, or excuse me, deliberative settings, where dispassionateness is the norm. But Gutman and Thompson rebut this claim by saying that deliberation can be consistent with impassioned and emotional or immoderate speech. And they support this with two claims. On one hand, they say that agonistic or non-deliberative means may be used to initiate the process of deliberation itself. Hence, agonistic speech can often serve as a catalyst for deliberation. On the other hand, they claim that deliberation itself does not always have to take the form of reasoned argument of the kind that philosophers are inclined to favor. The second crucial problem for the principle of accountability is that professional politicians often have to communicate the reasons for their political ideals to an unsophisticated electorate. So they say aggregative or procedural democratic models bypass this problem because within them, politicians are merely responsible for explaining their support for or of specific policies and effects they bring about as opposed to being obligated to explain their reasons for their support of those policies, which is an extra burden required by deliberative democratic models. The danger then is that deliberative democratic models have a potential to slip into vulgar popularism or populism where politicians resort to sophistry and demagoguery in order to garner public approval. Because deliberative accountability requires representatives to give reasons to citizens and to respond to the reasons citizens give. And critics object that this not only degrades public discourse, but also impedes representatives in the exercise of their own best judgment. But again, we're faced with a nagging question. Must representatives defer to the position of their constituents or can they make their own decisions? And the quick and simple answer that these people give is that, I mean, politicians have the authority to make use of their own judgments in controversial matters, except when the basic rights and opportunities of citizens are threatened. But. Politicians have a duty to go through a continuous, deliberative process with their constituents. Much like a contractual bargaining situation where the exchange of proposals and their revision is hashed out until an amicable settlement of some kind can be reached. At least the, reiter uh, the reiteration of deliberation will result in a more accurate reflection of the considered judgments of the political expert and the electorate. If the expert politician and his constituency cannot reach a happy medium through this process, his constituency can always elect what they find to be a more suitable candidate to express their social political concern. So you gotta be accountable if you're a politician. You need to be able to explain to some degree, why you made that choice. 
And if you don't or want to be open to the public to figure out why you're making these kind of choices, then you need to fucking get somebody else in there, man. But see, right now, black people have this idea that the same good old people who was working for us before going to continue to work in our interest after. We don't even demand any fucking accountability for the politicians that we have. Our politicians die in political office, man. But that's a whole nother thing. So we already dealt with the problem of specialization. Now it's time to deal with the problem of constituency and then I'm done with this shit for the night. Okay? After this, I'm done with this, bro. And I'm giving you this lesson. It's going to get easier to understand. This is the most difficult and abstract part of it all. But I got to talk to you two more times. I'm going to come on tomorrow and I'm going to give you a conversation about Iris Young and her theory of deliberative democracy. And then the last person is the person who I think is the most important and the most substantive for black folks because we still keep going through the same dumb shit politically. The problem of constituency. So the problem of specialization is a top-down problem. It's a vertical problem. What are the people at the top supposed to do in order to be accountable to the people at the bottom? So the problem of specialization is a problem in that it regards how politicians relate to those who are dependent upon their ability to express their social political concerns. But the problem of constituency is a horizontal problem. And it's related to the impact the politicians' policies have on those who lie outside the scope of their political constituency. But still lie within the domain of their moral considerations. So this, it's, it, man, this is just a commonly accepted view of representative democracy. It assumes that it is best for all citizens to have representatives that look after their own local interest. So in the same way, the invisible hand, which is a co concept from Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, that the invisible hand is thought to create efficiency in the market. Parochialism should bring about moral equilibrium in the political system. But by contrast, Gutman and Thompson argued that in order to meet, um, excuse me, in order to meet the demands of generality, politicians have to be aware of the fact that their policies affect more than just their constituents. But also that they affect a vast host of others in space and time. That's a lot to take in right there. They argue, Amy Gutman and Dennis Thompson do, that elected officials are accountable even to people who are non-residents, disadvantaged groups, and future generations, and not just their own constituencies exclusively. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about that here, but it should be evident that Gutman and Thompson have argued for a robust notion of accountability, and that their deliberative democratic conception requires that elected officials be accountable to not only those who they directly represent, but to others as well. Now, I'm not going to go into all of this, but what I am saying is that, in summary, Gutman and Thompson have developed a deliberative democratic theory that aims in, keep, uh, aims in keeping communication going in the presence of deep-seated moral disagreement. You got a lot of moral disagreement going on in this country right now on a whole host of issues. Straight versus gay. Men's rights and activism versus the feminists. Abortion versus pro-lifers. Gun enthusiasts versus people who feel like you shouldn't have guns at all. People who want free market activity to be the paramount kind of activity. And then you got people who are more socialistic in their political and economic leanings. So what they want is a theory, a deliberative democratic theory that can keep communication going, even though you got all of these differences in morality in the society. 
And they say this kind of theory is necessary because of the growing condition of pluralism in Western democratic societies. To keep communication going, citizens, they say, are required to adopt regulative principles that constrain the kind of reasons that can be presented in political forums and in policy development procedures. Now, this deliberative model is what many people in political philosophy call pre-commitment models because it requires citizens to be pre-committed to the constraints imposed by an abstract set, excuse me, an abstract set of moral principles, reciprocity, publicity, and accountability. Now, the strengths and weeks of pre-commitment models in general need not be covered here, but one of the main objections to this theory will be that it requires an unnecessarily strong pre-commitment to rigid and abstract regulative principles. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about tomorrow. So we went through a lot. You're not going to be able to discern everything I said and get through it. But I just wanted to share that with you because there are people who think that there are different ways to approach the problems that we have in the kind of cultures, uh, you know, well, not the kind of culture, but there's a way to, to gain some sort of progress related to the moral disagreements that we have in this culture and that we could do a better job than what we're doing. Voting ain't it. Just voting by itself is not it, they say. Communicating related to reciprocity, publicity, and accountability is the way to go. But I'm going to show you the person next uh, uh, who disagrees with that viewpoint. Her name is Iris Young, and we'll cover that tomorrow. Any questions you got for me? And you better make it quick. If you don't, if you do, I'm going to be out of here. Because that was a lot to take in. And I'm sorry for talking so long. And I'm sorry for being so professorial and so abstract tonight. But I just wanted to feed that to you. Okay? I wanted to do that to you and for you tonight. If there's any questions about anything I just said, you can hit me up. I'm going to give you one minute. Otherwise, I'm out of here, man. It's Friday. I want to thank BGS. I want to thank everybody out there in the chat. All my members, Anthony Taylor, I see you. All my members, all my gorillas out there, I see you. But if there are no questions, I just want to thank everybody who contributed tonight. Force Windu, I see you. I call it, I see you. All the people who dedicated uh, some, some cash. Randall, I see you. All the people who donated, thank you so much. I appreciate it again. I'm going to come in tomorrow, though. I'm going to come in with some more. But then after I get through with all of this, then you'll be able to join me in having a political conversation that I feel is more sophisticated than the ones we've been having. And this is the reason why I wanted to go through all this. David the man says, a green gorilla, any thoughts on Hans Hopp's argument about the failure of democracy? In his text, democracy, the God that failed. Well, you know, I don't know who Hans Hopps is, so I would have to look at that. Maybe I uh, will come uh, tomorrow and uh, answer that question. And, and you can ask me that question, but I, I, I'll try to look, at, look into that. And uh, try to see if I can come up and develop an answer to that question. But I think, I think that as it pertains to black people in the United States, all we have is democracy. We don't have anything else. Ricky Manor says he has one question. Okay, go ahead, Ricky. Go ahead, talk to me, bro. Come on, hit me up. Hit me with the wide receiver, brother, so I can get up on out of here. Come on, Riggy. Hit me with the question, bro. How do we as a people unite of all classes? Man. That's the million dollar question. You know, I thought I had an answer to this question. Um, I thought I had an answer to this, to this question eight years ago. 
<laughs> I thought that I did. And now I'm I'm less uh confident that I have that I have an answer to that question. Uh and let me just say this, okay? So an- initially I thought that I could use naturalism as a way to show that people have more in common than they do in difference. And that that you know, people all across the world, man, like they need to come to the conclusion or come to the understanding that, like, look, our existential situation is unique. As far as we know, we're the only people on the planet, man, I mean, in the universe that has life. And that we only live one life. And that we can use what we know now to push ourselves towards a new point of view in of the cosmos in which is perceived as organic rather than mechanistic in which human beings are regarded as part of rather than as distinct from the cosmos in which human beings are seen as bonded together by empathy and they're symbiotically related to other species in the biosphere rather than independent and isolated from them in which spirit and matter are perceived as being inextricably united rather than perceived as separate and distinct substances. In which all things are understood to be joined together by a single unifying, uh, unifying force rather than as multiple individual things existing on their own accord. So I thought that, and I'm just telling you what I thought, I thought that research and cognitive science, neuroscience, evolutionary biology, moral psychology, developmental psychology, zoology, and anthropology would get us towards these insights. I thought that we were entering a new epoch that would stress cooperation and social responsibility rather than competition and individual self-interest. I thought, I thought we were understanding that, you know, although we're very competitive as a species and incentive driven, that's only part of our story. We are selfish, but we're social as well. Our culture mostly ignores our propensity for sociability, but it gives all this emphasis to our proclivity to selfishness. So I thought that we could get to the point where we would change some of our most deep-seated assumptions about human nature and begin to acknowledge our deep interconnection to one another and to the environment. And I felt that if we don't hurry up and do this, we might very well be looking at the demise of the human species. I mean, whether we like it or not, this is the black pill shit right here, BGS, that I've been talking about, you've been talking about. The rising circumstances of globalism are here. And they're just going to get worse. And to me, what I thought is this going to point to the need for the extension of empathy to all life in the biosphere. And I thought for the first time in the history of humanity, we were going to actually reach a truly global consciousness. I thought that our understanding of empathy and where it comes from I thought like our understanding of mirror neurons <laughs> would help us to understand that we have more in common than we do in difference and that we can feel each other but now nah, I don't know so much man I really don't know so much anymore I feel like we're just we feel like I don't know. I just feel like we're drifting apart. It's war against everybody. But we only live one life. This ain't Jumanji. What are we killing each other for, man? What are people hoarding things only for themselves for? They're just material objects. 
Ancient philosophers understood that having a lot of money in and of itself doesn't mean that you're a happy individual. Look, my man, Ricky Manor sounded like a Heracletian. <laughs> Said the universe is chaotic and from the chaos brings order. But anyway, man, you know, that's what I thought. And I still have hope for it, BGS. But I think that right now, you know, it's too many of us who, I think our own ideals, I think instead of moving to empathy and extending empathy, we're still stuck in the rationalization stage. All we want is what we want. We're, st we're ego. The, the, the Western culture we live in is ego driven. And that's all it is. Ego, 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 ego. If we don't get out of it, we're going to fuck the planet up. It just is what it is. We're going to destroy this place, man. And we're going to destroy each other. Right now, it's damn near 8 billion people in the world. This is the first time that you've had these kind of conditions. Our technology has enabled us to be so successful. And our development technologically has enabled us to be so successful that our own success is getting us to the point to right now where we're going to destroy each other. So our very success is leading to our destruction. And at the very same time, the human beings have nothing meaningful to latch on to other than materialism. So, but that's another subject of discussion altogether, man. But I love y'all, man. It's a Friday night, man. Thank you so much for joining me here tonight, man. I will be back tomorrow. I know I said I was going to be back on, on Wednesday and I didn't come back Thursday, but I promise I'll be here tomorrow. And I just want to get this done and over with so I can begin to have political conversations that I feel are... Uh, You know, they're, they're the more substantive than the ones we've been having. So thank y'all, man. I appreciate y'all, and I appreciate your presence and everything y'all do. One, I'll see y'all later, man. Be easy, y'all. Peace. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm a phenomenon, I shine like Orion I came in a rap gang to smack it up like Heron Transform it like Megatron Wait, like Yamatron Most rappers are some peons I'ma starve them like Ramadan I'm troublesome You don't really want no troublesome Cause I pop guns like hood Tick, do bubble gum I've like been dumb Gon' stay that way Till kingdom come When the sun I'm at Unleash the demon of Polygon I'm heavy, son Got more knowledge than Farrakhan More gang than Cap Karma that bitch some ning don one Stay lit off some Shandan Maybe I'll call the rhymes Stay great some Nordstrom Call me that Dapper Don More brighter than Genghis Khan The Dominion Nipples are Taliban, niggas faker than silicon Get hit like a dot com, like soldiers in Lebanon I'm bringing that red rum When I get through with you, son, you gon' think I'll see rap Run! I carry weight like a heavyweight Break more cakes than patty cake Watch the fiends salivate, you a lightweight Phantom weight, better contemplate If you violate, make you levitate to the pearly gates I fascinate when I conversate From the show me state, where these niggas love to hate And hot murder rate, or the waste But this flow is just a taste of God's grace Shining this light in an ugly place in a prophecy, got more wisdom than Socrates Philosophies, you don't really want no parts of me. Can't you see? I'm sticking to Mephistopheles, stronger than Hercules. More dangerous than the third of Damocles. The MCs crying me, pretty please. I went up they white tees, knock them out they wallabies. Now they touch my deliries. But coming up short in the little seas when I break out the killer bees. I slept in music by Kirkasi, hit chicks look like a shanty. When I'm breaking them off, they yell out, I'm poppy. You rack rappers is sloppy, you can't stop me with that. We can stop it, copy, copy, my lucky. I'm a monster like Frankenstein, but hotter than Palestine. You slams, dropping down. A snake and serpentine can't stand the sneaky glow like knobs with a big shine. All you hate is cold in it, cold sores, need calamine. But my hot shit like red bricks hitting your head. Leave the sour taste up in your mouth like human heads, like simply red. Wasted some years up in the feds when I touch down, hold dirty red that gave me head. I got higher vision for higher living. I'm highly driven. I'm making women like it's some sort of sick religion. Driving an impala sitting on it, 20 inches and they spinning just like the planets in the solar system. Black country people. Over in Africa, down to America, black country people, we make all the world go round and around, yeah, black country people.
people uh, up in Canada, down to Jamaica. Black country people, uh, we make all the world go round and around.